Archive of African American Oral History. Did folks enjoy that? Very good. A really historic moment for us uh, at the University of Florida and in the Gainesville community. Uh, we have a wonderful panel uh, coming up. I want to just a couple administrative issues. If you're just joining us, uh, we have restrooms right outside here. Um, and if you need to find one and you're not sure, please ask a staff member uh, from the oral history program. And we're easily identifiable by our badges, our lanyards and badges. Uh, we also have a shuttle running to uh, Midtown restaurants that's running periodically and also back to that free parking in the North Lawn. Um, I did want to preview briefly our program for tomorrow. This is day two. Uh, and we're going to continue to have some wonderful uh, programs. Well, actually, I'll mention just briefly this afternoon. Don't leave us. If you go to lunch, please come back because we have a real treat for you after lunch. Uh, we have two student-made documentaries, uh, the first on the Institute of Black Culture at the University of, of Florida, the second on the making of the Institute of Hispanic Latino Cultures, or La Casita, at UF, many of you have been following, if you're, if you're students, you, you've been in the midst of this, uh, but perhaps you've, you've been able to follow this from outside. Uh, we're currently rebuilding uh, these very important institutions on campus created uh, by student activism, created, uh, Mr. Taylor, be proud of, proud of this new generation of students who really put us on call and said, we want these buildings recreated. This is how we want them. This is why they're so important black culture, Latino culture. And so this panel helps us talk about the intersections uh, between black and Latino cultures in part and, and many other things. Finally, I'll mention tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow we're not going to be meeting here. Uh, don't come here for the, 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 the uh, <laughs> symposium tomorrow. Instead, we'll go to Aquin Jones Center on 1013 Northwest 7th Avenue, and we're going to have a really remarkable uh, session um, I was going to point out our colleagues from, from Ocoee who are up here, but I don't see them. Any of our Ocoee? Oh, uh, they're, they're right there. Tomorrow, the, one of our amazing sessions is going to be titled Ocoee, Florida, 100 Years of Accountability and Reconciliation. Let's give our, our colleagues from Ocoee a round of applause, by the way. Thank you. So it is my great pleasure to introduce a dear colleague uh, and friend, uh, professor from uh, both the Department of History and African American Studies, uh, Lauren Perlman. And when we thought about this panel, History, Intersectionality, and Liberation in the Age of Black Lives Matter, uh, Lauren came to mind immediately as a person to facilitate this. Those of you who are students, uh, faculty, know that in the time that she's been here, and I should mention she is an assistant professor, uh, she has made an immediate quick in positive impact on this university. So please join me in welcoming our facilitator for this panel, uh, Professor Lauren Perlman. Thank you. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, well, we're really excited to be here today. And I want to introduce um, the rest of the panelists. Um, and I want you to actually um, maybe you can do better justice to your biographies than I can. But um, Max Crockmall, Naila Summers, and um, Vincent Adejumo are here with me. And if you want to just introduce yourself, and then I, what, how we'll run this today is they're going to say a few words about their work and ideas about these important, um, this important pressing social justice issue of our time. And, um, and then we want to really open it up to audience participation, to comments, questions from you guys, because we talk a lot, and we'd like to hear what you have to say. So thank you for being here, and we'll get started. Hello, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Max Crockmall. I'm coming here from Fort Worth, Texas, where I'm a scholar at TCU and an activist. And um, I'll tell you a little bit more about Texas, and I think what it has to do with um, the work you all are doing here in Florida. Hey, everybody. My name is Naila Summers, uh, former. <laughs> Stop it. Well, um, thanks, y'all. Good to be back. Uh, former student at UF, uh, Samuel Oral Proctor, uh, uh, SPOP, <laughs> History Project uh, alumni, and um, I'm a co-founder of the Dream Defenders and also the communications director for the Dream Defenders. 
Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Vincent Adejumo. I am currently the lecturer of African American Studies here at the University of Florida. Um, I started here at the University of Florida in uh, 2011, completed my graduate studies, and have been a full-time uh, lecturer since that time. So I have done a few things in the community, and I'm um, looking forward to the talk today. All right, so I'm going to give a, a kind of semi-formal quick talk and, uh, and let's see if I can swap that. All right, so good morning again. Uh, thank you, Paul Ortiz, for having me here. This is really wonderful uh, to be with all of you, and I've learned a lot and, and gotten to experience uh, the amazing work of, of this program, and thanks to all the staff and, and to Lauren. Um, man, it got dark in here. Can we make it a little bit brighter? <laughs> Um, so uh, Paul had asked me to just prepare some remarks about, about my work on Texas uh, in hopes that it might be useful to you all. So um, I'm going to do that for a few minutes and, and not too long because I do want there to be time for discussion. Um, so I'm wearing mostly my historian hat today, uh, but I, I am also an activist and maybe we can talk a little bit about that too. This is a book I wrote called Blue Texas. It's out in the lobby if you want to get your hands on one. Um, and, and the reason I start with this is to tell you a story. So this picture on the right is from August 28, 1963, the same day as the March on Washington. And the second largest march in America happened in Austin, Texas, where there are some thousand plus people marching from the segregated east side uh, to the Capitol uh, and demanding freedom now. But it was a mixed group, right? Not just African Americans, but also Mexican Americans, white liberals and labor activists. Uh, and people who come together in something that they called simply the Democratic Coalition uh, of the mid-1960s. So here they are gathered after the march uh, at a park where they held a rally. And, um, and this is 1963, so by this moment they're demanding immediate integration, they're demanding freedom, there have been direct action protests, sit-ins, all kinds of things all over Texas, much like the rest of the South. Um, but they, they also connected their work in the streets to political action, uh, and they were able to register to vote at higher numbers than other places in the South, and as we'll see, they were able to do it in concert with others. So they came out at this, at this rally, and they gave the typical end of March speeches, right, where they went after the governor, but as you'll see, they did it in an unusual manner. So one of the leaders, an a NAACP leader, an attorney uh, with the Texas Council of Voters, says they'll never separate the Latin American and Negroes again in politics. They'll never separate independent white man and the Negro again. They'll never separate labor and the Negro again. Right? We're going to fight in the streets, at the ballot box, and in the courts. Right? And it was reciprocated right? from Henry Munoz, a representative of a group called the Political Association of Spanish-Speaking Organizations. So broadly speaking, my book, my work, right, is about this question, about black, brown, political, and uh, activist coalitions, how they forge, how they exist, how they evolve over time, what drives them, what role white liberals and labor can also play. And so strange as it may now seem, right, you look at Texas, and I, I wrote a book called Blue Texas, and you're like, what's that, right? But um, in fact, uh, not only was it democratic, uh, you know, democratic party state, but there was a robust multiracial liberal movement in Texas in which African Americans, Mexican Americans, and whites came together to challenge the power structure. Uh, and they did it, again, in the streets and at the ballot box. So this diagram kind of shows you the major legs of that coalition. And I'll talk a little bit more about the African-American wing in particular, uh, and for the rest, you'll need to consult the book. But this is the Texas Council of Voters. So in Texas in the 1950s, the NAACP was outlawed uh, and served injunctions. Their offices raided. They were dragged into a kangaroo court for more than a year in, in Tyler, Texas. Uh, and so the activists uh, that had built the NAACP um, going back to the 19-teens, but really it took off in the, in the 30s and 40s, um, sort of redirected their efforts into new channels. They had local organizations such as in Houston, one called the Harris County Council of Organizations, and then they also had a political action group called the Texas Council of Voters. So the people on this slide are some of the local activists that I highlight in the story. I use oral history extensively as well as other sources. The guy on the bottom left, his name is G.J. Sutton. He's an undertaker in San Antonio who uh, in 1948, that early, 1948, he formed a coalition with, an, uh, with a Latino attorney, and both of them got elected to local school boards. Um, 
he was the first African American in, in Texas since Reconstruction, right, to be elected to office. Uh, and the guy in the middle, I'm sure you recognize, is Thurgood Marshall. Uh, to his left, uh, our right, is W.J. Durham, the gentleman who gave that rousing speech that I showed on the first slide. Um, the Houston NAACP during World War II became, grew to become the second largest chapter in all of America, and it was rooted in the black working class. Uh, and they helped to generate a series of landmark court cases, right, that they organized. First, Smith versus Allwright, right, which ended the white primary, and then Sweat versus Painter. So this is actually the two of them litigating the Sweat case, which desegregated higher education and became the key precedent for Brown versus Board. The gentleman on the far right is Mr. Moses Leroy, and he's one of the main characters, along with his wife, who I highlight in the book. And uh, Mr. Leroy was an uh, uh, African-American man, a, a railroad worker, and a trade unionist. And he came up through uh, the Southern Pacific Railroad Yards, where he fought to get into the unions. They wouldn't let him in, of course, because he was black, so he organized a black auxiliary and fought to desegregate the Southern Pacific Railroad for several decades. He helped build the Progressive Party, a radical left-leaning third party in the 1940s. Uh, he helped collect nickels and dimes at work and on street corners for those court cases I talked about, built the local chapter of the NAACP with Mrs. Lulu White, and ultimately helped found a whole series of organizations. By 1960, he was already an old man, and yet he still participated in the sit-in movement in Houston. Um, and when the, a bunch of student activists uh, got locked up, he and a bunch of African-American longshoremen uh, organized to, to get them out, right, and, and did so successfully. Um, he and his wife, Mrs. Leroy, Mrs. Irma Leroy, was also an activist. She actually ran for office as an independent in the 1940s, um, and, uh, and also this map shows their work doing um, a lot of on-the-ground organizing, building political capacity in a region that they called Deep East Texas. Uh, where they would go year after year to register voters, to, um, to teach people how to organize in their communities, to resist white racism and violence, which was very much present there as it is, was across the South. Uh, and, um, and they slowly built this grassroots movement that turned into the, uh, the, the Democratic coalition of the 1960s. Here's a photo from 1966. Mr. Leroy is in the middle participating in a march of the United Farm Workers, right? the Mexican-Americans who marched in 1966 from the Rio Grande Valley on the border all the way to Austin to protest. And he and other African-Americans met them there in, this is actually along the way, but met them in Austin to demand a minimum wage together. So all that's to say is that they, they came together and, and when Mr. Leroy and others built this a vision of how we're gonna take down Jim Crow, their answer ultimately was to by building multi-ethnic alliances. They, they confronted intra-racial opposition, right, from their so-called race leaders, middle-class professionals who often were okay with um, sort of slow progress, with gradualism, with tokenism, uh, and for he and others who wanted independent power for their communities, they found an alternate route and it was crossing the color line. So that's the story I tell in the book. Happy to talk more about it later if you want. I wanted to quickly share with you a couple other projects. This is Civil Rights in Black and Brown. So um, doing the research for the book, it was quickly apparent that we had only scratched the surface of a much larger story. And so with help from Dr. Ortiz and others, um, I started the Civil Rights in Black and Brown Oral History Project. We went out and we conducted 500 some odd interviews around Texas, every corner of Texas with African American and Mexican American and some white activists. And we built this database and you can find it at crbb.tcu. Each interview is broken into little clips where you can um, actually find them very specific subject information. So if anything I said just now interests you, you want to learn about sit-ins in Houston, go look on here and you'll find five or six different people talking about that. As I said, we fanned out all over the state, multiracial teams to go do these interviews. Um, we interviewed uh, sort of more traditional on the right, Mexican-American political leaders. On the left, a, a Black Panther from Houston, Mr. James Aaron, a founder of People's Party Two there, a sort of rank and file Panther. Um, and everything in between. This is Ms. Abdullah, who uh, was a student activist at Stephen F. Austin University and who helped to build um, a powerful movement there that had never been documented. The newspapers systematically did not report on it. And so we were able to recover some of these histories and, and are writing a book now uh, based on this collection. Um, I'll fast forward to the present moment just quickly and say that this coalition's emerging again, right, in Texas. And I'm working on it and trying to help with. Uh, using this history to, to help inform present-day work. Um, and, of course, been very inspired by 
Dream Defenders and others who have been building coalitions in other places. Um, but this is the work we're doing, and I'm a member of United Fort Worth, which is one of the organizations uh, represented on here. Um, but what we're seeing, and the, the reason why Beto O'Rourke came close to beating Ted Cruz right, last fall, was because we've been doing this grassroots work on the ground by building alliances in local communities in Houston. Right? Houston's a deep, dark, liberal city now. It has an African-American mayor. Uh, it's, uh, the, um, the Texas Organizing Project has been doing wonderful work on the ground there, registering voters, and also pushing the city to enact crim meaningful criminal justice reform. Um, and you know, so the, the whole bunch of different groups coming together uh, to build uh, a new alliance for power and for democracy in our state. Um, let's see what else here. Oh, so this is just the end and, and me. I published some of this in the LA Review of Books. If you want to go check it out, you can, you can read the shorter version, um, and not, but not the big fat doorstop of a book that's out there. Um, but also check out the website, and uh, I, I'd love to talk to you more about, um, about this history, about the present work, uh, and about how we can, across the South and Southwest, really um, transform uh, our communities and, and create democracy in our time. So thank you. Um, Can I stay here? Okay. Um, hi, everybody. Um, thanks, Max. That was pretty much a spoiler alert for everything that we're going to talk about, um, about the work of the Dream Defenders. So I think I just want to say and shout out uh, UF, shout out uh, Dr. Ortiz and SPOP, um, and all the folks that really sort of took care of me in my time at UF, um, Dr. Austin. And I think my journey and, you know, some of what I was involved in or, or how I came to become a Dream Defender happened on this campus. I was taking a history of black and Latino history class uh, with Dr. Ortiz my first semester here. And um, I am half Cuban American, half African American. And it was like, oh my God, look at my people working together across history. And so it was like, it was a moment, it was an awakening of sorts. And then, you know, I took a, a trip to the Mississippi Delta that SPOP does every year. Um, I did that trip twice. And um, I feel like so many of you have heard this story because you've known me for so many years. But we went to um, an Emmett Till Museum in, in the Delta area. I think it was like Tallahatchie, maybe? Glendora, Glendora, Mississippi. Um, and on exiting the museum after we've done the tour and I've cried my eyes out, um, a woman approached me and I think maybe one other SPOP alumni um, and was like, are you one of the students that's visiting from Florida? I was like, yeah, absolutely. What's up? Hi, how are you? Um, and so she hands me this postcard um, and it's her son hanging from a tree on it. Um, Frederick Germain Carter was his name. And so it's like, you know, bawling my eyes out, meeting this mother whose son had just been found hanging from a tree about six months before that. Um, and it was just like this earth shattering experience. Um, and that was in September and in February of 2012, Trayvon Martin died. So it was like these sort of back to back to back experiences. Um, so Trayvon Martin died and I was just on this campus, losing my mind, enraged, sad, didn't know what to do. And I got an email from Dr. Ortiz for, um, it was going to be a conference call for angry Florida students, right, that wanted to do something about Trayvon Martin. And I still have that call, it was like March, March, maybe March something, uh, 2012. And I got on that call and after a series of calls, we became the Dream Defenders, right? Um, and so our first course of action, 40 days after Trayvon Martin had been killed, 40 days later, um, he, George Zimmerman hadn't been arrested. So we got together and 40 of us did a three day, 40 mile march from Bethune Cookman's campus in uh, Daytona to Sanford, Florida, where Trayvon Martin had been killed and we went to the, the gated community, you know, let's talk about gated communities and how they're not really safe and how they pretend, you know, whatever. That's a thing that we can do forever. But um, so we went there and Easter weekend, we 
six of us um, linked arms while the rest of us supported and blocked the doors to the Sanford Police Department, which was brand new, multi-million dollar project. Um, and the corner store right next to it, you know, had like chicken wire um, separating the people from, from the cashier. So it was just such a stark difference, right? And I think that that experience has carried over with us for all these years. But so we blocked the police station and three days after that, Trayvon, I mean, George Zimmerman was arrested. Three days later, Angela Corey called us on the phone while we were blocking. She was the, the prosecutor. Called us on the phone trying to get us to go away um, while we were blocking these doors. And yeah, three days later. Um, and you know, so from there, I think until Zimmerman was acquitted the next year, we were trying to figure out who we were. Who are these young students? We're black, we're brown, we're from Florida. What are we going to do with all this momentum we've got? How are we going to change this, this, this country? How are we going to tackle criminalization, which landed Trayvon Martin where he was, right? He was at his father's house because he had been suspended from school because they found a baggie of marijuana in his book bag. Um, so what are the systems that made this happen and how do we tackle them? Zimmerman's acquitted a year later and we occupied the uh, Capitol in Tallahassee. It was 30 nights, 31 days and 30 nights. Um, I was going back and forth between Tallahassee and Gainesville because we were teaching like a black history course at the, um, at the Boys and Girls Club in, in Woodland Park. Is it Woodland Park? Um, and so, you know, that was huge. We ended up on, on, on MSNBC and we were on CNN and we were the kids that took over the Capitol. And at the end of it, we were pushing for Trayvon's, uh, Trayvon's Law, something that we made up that was getting rid of Sandra Ground, tackling the school to prison pipeline, and finding a way to end racial profiling, right? And this was this thing that we were demanding that they call a special session for, and they refused. We met with, with Rick Scott. It was six of us in a room with Rick Scott. Rick Scott was wearing a... Conf Rick Scott, <laughs> now Senator Rick Scott, in that room met with us and he was wearing cowboy boots with a Confederate flag on them. Um, so, you know, we did this thing, we tried, we failed, but, you know, people knew who we were. We were talking about Trayvon Martin, we were talking about criminalization of young people. And the Capitol passed the law, right? Nobody can sleep at the Capitol anymore because of us. Um, but in the time since then, I think the Dream Defenders have been in an intense project of learning and learning from history. Um, about a year after the Capitol, when we went home, there was sort of an analysis period where what did we change? What did we win? Who did we affect? Who was even here with us, right? In the beginning, there was lots of momentum. People were coming to the Capitol to, to sit in with us and sleep with us. But at the end of it, it was just us. There wasn't community there. Like, so what, we were taking stock of what our effect was. And I think a lot of what came out of that was the need to study history, the need to talk about or, or study people that came before us. So this, like, all the things that Max just showed us were some of the things that we were studying, right? We, we, we studied deeply um, Emile Call Cabral, who was an organizer in Cape Verde who for 10 years, almost, was involved in a listening project all over the country, asking people what they needed, right? And one of, the, one of the conclusions was like, okay, we need independence from Portugal. One of the other things was creating a new we. How do we get people that look like us, but are from different, from different neighborhoods, how do we get people to come together and really identify with one another and fight for the fact that we, we know we deserve better? Right? So one of the things, um, I didn't bring extra copies, but one of the things that this work and uh, the listening that we've done in the last three or four years, I think some of the fruits of that labor have become the Freedom Papers. And the Freedom Papers is our declaration, sort of our manifesto, that says we deserve so much more than we're getting. There is enough resources in this country and in this world for everybody to have a quality public education, to have food, water, shelter, freedom from police and prisons, freedom from war and violence, freedom from poverty, 
And there is absolutely no reason that we can't have these things, right? Like, what is the world we're building so that we don't have more Trayvon Martin, so that we're not always in mourning for our people because we couldn't, or, or, or people in power refuse to give us the things that we need. Um, and so this is, this is, you know, look it up, <laughs> the Freedom Papers. I think the end is really indicative. I'm gonna, I'm gonna read it real quick. Um, and this was inspired by, what is the, imagine the angels of bread. Who's the poet, what's his name? Martina Spada, right? He has a, a poem called Imagine the Angels of Bread, and we remixed it, for lack of a better term. But this is the year that rent freezes, that no family faces eviction to make way for a new highway or high-rise or coffee shop or parking lot. This is the year that governments call emergency sessions, threaten filibusters, or government shutdowns if opponents refuse multi-billion dollar bailout packages for single mothers. This is the year four time fe felons found guilty of falling in traps are found running in Miami and running in Pahokee and running in Duval for Senate, Mayor, and Governor. This is the year abuelas and grands made maids rise at dawn, pack blankets, make meals, board buses to beaches to bathe, bath, laugh in suns once served under. If our liberation began with the vision of a world without the colony, slum, favela, and ghetto, then this is the year. So let every one of us, hungry, tired, yet undefeated, lasso a new North Star and study war no more. Right? This is like the vision that we can all have, that we all deserve, and that we're fighting for. <laughs> so really quickly, I think... Where we are now is we're looking at 2020 and we're looking at 2022, right? How can we as a people take all the things that we deserve and actually fight for them, put it into practice? What does this look like as a policy? What does it look like to have a package of things where we're divesting from the war economy, where we're, where we're divesting from uh, police, where we're div divesting from prisons and creating new safety. We want to redesi redefine what safety means for our people and start to, to govern. What does it look for, like for us to have something like this as our guiding star when our people in our, are in office? What does it look like for Florida to have a people's governor, right? How are we going to make DeSantis a one-term person when we know that he is in bed with the prison companies and the war companies and all these profiteers that are actively making decisions that are harming our lives? So, you know, we're, it's, it's lots of strategy meetings and imagining sessions and what do we want Florida to look like in 2020, but it's all uh, based in this document. And thank you, y'all. Thank you. Okay, um, I was looking at uh, the the uh, the title of this this talk and, I, and the word intersectionality, and I'm re reminded uh, with my students yesterday we were discussing. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the rapper Kodak Black. Um, in my Black Masculinity course, we were discussing, or they wanted to discuss Kodak Black, Cat Calling, Young M.A. And I said, No, nah, we're gonna table that to after the 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 the, the, course, the class is over, but. Um, and, and what I realized, um, as far as, especially in looking at my purpose for being here, um, being defined over the years, um, and really um, in looking at the purpose for uh, academia, especially as it pertains to um, black scholars and academics, um, providing that space for our students to have those uh, conversations and, um, and since my time here at the University of Florida, as I said before, I started here in 2011, um, it got real from the first day that I was here. Now, of course, I'm from Florida, so I understand the dynamics of, of Gainesville. And um, I remember my first day being here, um, I wore a suit, uh, first day being here for graduate uh, studies, I wore a suit and I was walking down the street, going one way on university. And I, was, I was just coming from the Institute of Black Culture um, and going the opposite way was a red truck. Um, and it had a, 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 the, the um, you know, KKK symbol on it. And I remember this, this white guy sticking his head out the truck, yelling, nigger, 
going the opposite way, and I was like, oh yeah, this, this is this definitely, I gotta be on my A game out here. <laughs> And so, um, and so in, in since being here at the University of Florida, what I realized, as I said before, um, you know, just starting out a little bit about me, um, I came here in 2011, um, started my graduate studies in political science. And, um, and the interesting part about that uh, with, what, uh, with what Nyla mentioned about systems. Now, of course, the political science um, curriculum here at the University of Florida is from a Eurocentric perspective. Um, and so while we were experiencing these things at the University of Florida, um, and while I was going through my uh, curriculum here at the University of Florida, I realized that, um, and of course I'm of African descent, my father's from Nigeria directly, and I realized that um, I have to, you know, not only learn what's going on in the classroom as far as this Eurocentric uh, curriculum that's being taught to me, but I have to kind of reorient myself um, from that um, pretty often to make sure that I'm not getting quote unquote lost in the sauce, right? Um, and because there, that typically happens um, with our students here and it's like, okay, there's different types of paradigm. In fact, uh, one of the things we talk about in the Black Masculine course that I teach is the ghetto-centric um, uh, uh, frame of mindset. So, but anyway, um, and, so, and so in doing that and, 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 and decompressing, so come to this, uh, to the classroom and all of the outside things going on. So I was also here around the time with Trayvon Martin. And not only just Trayvon Martin, because that became, at first it started as a regional story in Florida and then it went national, right? But also what was going on here at the University of Florida, right? Uh, you know, you had the blackface incident in 2011, and then you had the blackface incident in 2012, <laughs> right? Back to back, uh, same situation, Halloween, you know, white frat boys being ignorant. And, um, and so, again, so those things, uh, coupled with what was going on, Trayvon Martin, coupled with also the, um, the second election of uh, uh, President Barack Obama at that time, you know, really, really start to um, develop me. And also the conversations I uh, have here with the um, people here and faculty and staff on this campus, especially African American studies. Um, at that time period. And so realizing that, I mean, uh, that this, this, this school, uh, you know, talks a lot about the diversity, um, talks a, lo a lot about, you know, wanting to have this many people and that many people, but then you start to realize is that a lot of this talk is very cosmetic. And so, and so the thing about it is, is that, so as I uh, completed my um, degree, uh, my course of study, and, uh, uh, and I completed that in uh, 2015, and so, um, and, and a lot of people didn't realize what I was doing was reorienting myself to that Afrocentric way of thinking. So it allowed me to create classes such as Black Masculinity, uh, a course based on um, The Wire, uh, mentoring at risk youth, kind of uh, redeveloping that course, uh, and also the the course that uh, that a lot of students uh, students find value in all those courses, but especially in the Black Wall Street course that I teach, and in all the courses that I teach, I try to make sure that we are involved in the community, right? Because I often tell my students is that uh, you around here hollering, you know, Black Lives Matter and all these different um, hashtags concerning our people, but yet you don't even want to go outside of 13th and 34th. So what does that say about you, right? You don't even want to go outside of 13th and 34th, and especially if you're black. You know, how can you say that you want to do this work and you for this work, but you don't want to even be around your own people? outside of this space. And so this is the thing that um, in, in, in developing these classes and teaching these courses, you know, I'm, I'm most proud of. So for example, for the mentoring at risk youth, uh, and plenty of, many of my students are here today uh, who have taken those courses with me. And so with the mentoring at risk youth, I lecture the students uh, for part of the week, and then the, uh, the other part of the week, they actually go to the east side of Gaines. I don't even know if many of you are familiar with that, but some of you are community leaders in here, and you're not, you, don't even, you don't even have a clue of that was going on, right? So I did that start off in 2016. And one of the, 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 the crowning spaces that we use um, to, uh, to enable that um, so we, 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 I lecture the students for part of the week as far as what is an at-risk student is. 
and then or at risk youth is and so typically we understand what that is and then they go to the uh, different community centers in Gainesville, Porter's Community Center, MLK Center, uh, and, and so uh, uh, Kelly Center. So all these different um, centers in the summer and we do this work in the summer. And so then what happens is at the end of the year uh, we have a banquet and so the first year we did it we actually had a banquet at the Institute of Black Culture and that's another touching off point as far as the, the work that we still have to do here at the University of Florida. So at that time, we understood uh, that they uh, uh, um, tore it down, said they was gonna rebuild it. Um, and, and the thing about it is, is that, but the way they, in which they wanted to rebuild it was very problematic, combining the uh, La Casita with the Institute of Black Culture. And so I, and, and tell them, I, and at first some of the students didn't see that that wasn't a problem, but I'm saying, okay, but you wouldn't merge a Muslim house with a Jewish house, would you? So why would you do that with it, with, within this situation? It's two completely different cultures, right? And so, um, so we were, so in, in doing that, and again, this was the summer that these talks were uh, touching off. They created the, the hashtag, uh, No La Abisita. Again, some of the students here are, are in there who were part of that movement. And, uh, and it was the summer that these talks were having. So I guess the administration thought that uh, having those talks in the summer, uh, the students was, uh, wouldn't be here, but it was people here. And thankfully, uh, you know, the students were able to uh, create the awareness of that um, through this hashtag and using the tools and means that they have available to them to make sure that uh, the, the project would not be uh, created in a way that would be combining of the houses, right? So it'd be built separately. So that's one of the things I'm, I'm proud of um, since being here. And also, um, and also in looking at and taking an approach to looking at the history of this state, the history of not only this state, but how this state um, and the University of Florida has worked hand in hand um, on a lot of racist policies. Um, in this state, and one of, one of them being the, 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 the Stand Your Ground, uh, which Dream Defenders. And, and, and one of the things I like to talk about in the courses, throughout the courses, and, and one of the things I, I, I highlight, and a lot of people don't really uh, pay attention to, is looking at the land grants, right? And so looking at how, uh, so when you talk about land grants, what are we talking about? We're talking about land, we're talking about space, we're talking about real estate, right? And so you say, and so we asked the students, well, how did the university become the University of Florida? And one of the things I like what uh, Dr. Paul T said is that, well, first of all, University of Florida would not be a top 10 institution if it wasn't for black and brown students being here first and foremost. And then secondly, <laughs> and, 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 and then secondly, in, in looking at how this, uh, this institution was able to procure the land, right, through these land grants, well, first of all, someone had to get the shorter in the stick. And so I teach them about how Florida a and was also a land-grant institution. Uh, it still is a land-grant institution. However, the uh, state legislature did not give, uh, uh, and many of, and who was in the state legislature at this time? Many University of Florida graduates, right? And did not give uh, 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 Florida a and uh, its due in land grants, not until 1967. Right. So from 1903 to 1960. So I so I tell my students. So if it was really uh, uh, equal access, equal to resources, right? Would a school such as Florida A and M University be equal as far as prestige to the University of Florida? And so these are the things that in in in, in using that history to really inspire the students, you know, to think outside of the box. And lastly, I, I want to say. Um, with the Black Wall Street class, it's been a fundamental tool because as a community, as, as a people, but especially as a black people, we have to get beyond, and I have to, and I, I try to get my students to see beyond, okay, this binaryism in politics that at the end of the day serves the interests, for lack of a better term, of white folk. And so, and, and so in building this class, in the Black Wall Street class, and looking at the fundamental of the economic situation and, and bringing to attention to them that black people in this country, we have always been, had a tradition of, of entrepreneurship, always. In fact, we ran the slave plantations as slave entrepreneurs, right? And so, and, and, and so, so, so since we first got here, 
And so in looking at the, 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 the historical tradition of entrepreneurship and also black business ownership and how that went away over time because of the, 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 the brainwashing, I would say, um, of our community, um, uh, of, of the larger dominant hegemonic society. And so in building that course and calling attention to the economic principles, um, and then not, not only that, but also bringing in the elders of the community to speak on these. So and, and in fact, one of the elders that I, that I brought to the classroom was, uh, and many of you know, um, Aaron Green, Fletcher's. And so him explaining the importance of having that, um, that, that, that self um, that self-help uh, mentality. Now, of course, that's not to say that you don't fight against the system. Of course you fight against the system, but at the same time, you have to do for self. You have to have a mentality of, okay, um, you know, this bread crumbing, this and that, where has that gotten us? When you look at the, the equality, true equality, economic equality, between black people and white people in this country, as I always say to my students and looking at the statistics and looking at the data here, the economic gap has actually widened between blacks and whites, despite the rhetoric of we need more diversity, we need this, this, this. <laughs> but when you actually look at it, and so the average uh, white family household is 950,000, the average black household is on a 120,000. Household, not individual. And so again, so calling attention uh, to these things in the classroom, uh, in the greater context, but also looking at the context in the University of Florida. Um, that's been my uh, uh, purpose here since I've been here, and I look forward to uh, expounding on that even more so as we move forward. Hi, I'm Tanya Saunders. I'm in the Center for Latin American Studies, associate professor. Um, I think my goal here today, and I, I'm sorry I was running late, so I didn't get to hear the first panelists, um, but I would like to challenge um, or blur the lines between blackness and Latinidad um, and actually kind of um, in conversation push back on the idea that um, black and Latinx are too distinct um, cultures, even though it's important to recognize the way in which the university continuously tries to minimize the space and the access that black and brown population has, which is, is, a, is a very real concern that I think um, is highlighted by, by that idea. And the reason why I say that is that there's no Latinx culture or cultures without um, Africans. Um, when I was at um, the NWSA conference uh, last fall, um, people were talking about uh, all of the issues happening to people around the world and you know as often happens I think even within a lot of activist communities within the United States um, those communities are very uh, Americentric that is um, in terms of how we think about blackness for example is very bounded by US uh, geopolitical borders um, that is, remembering that the history of black social movements within the United States was always intertwined with international movements um, throughout the world, but particularly with an eye towards the black communities and the large black populations that are also African Americans. And I'm talking about the other African Americans that exist in this hemisphere. And one of the things that, um, in a little protest situation with some friends and I um, at the NWSA conference, um, doing some of the panels, especially the ones that engaged in the question of Black Lives Matter, um, the, the social movements, you know, we passed around flyers that asked, well, does your black life matter if you speak Portuguese? Um, when we think about, when I think about the history of black studies in the United States, I think about Abdios do Nascimento, um, who in the early part of the 20th century, who was Brazilian, was here in the United States pushing for black studies to be incorporated into US American colleges and universities. I think about Arturo Schomburg that has the Schomburg Center for Black Culture named after him um, in New York City. And he's also a black Puerto Rican who in the early part of the 20th century was pushing for black studies to be incorporated into the US Academy. So what I would like for us to think about our, 
are things like, what are the Black Lives movements that are happening in the rest of the hemisphere? Um, why isn't there more connection between the movements here in the United States and, and movements within this very hemisphere where we share so many questions and challenges as Americans? The very hemispheric connections that we have culturally because all of our countries started the same way. Um, so when, one thing that I think about is one of the last times I was in Brazil, I heard this, this rumor. I don't know if it's true or not, but I think it's important the fact that it is a rumor, because that says a lot. And the rumor was that some Black Lives Matter activists came down to Brazil and decided to teach Brazilian activists and help Brazilian activists develop social movements around the black genocide that's happening in Brazil. Now, people have been talking about the black genocide, black activists, black scholars, for decades. Um, for over 70 years, the United Black Social Movements have been fighting for black rights in Brazil. Why don't we know about any of that? And why isn't that included or incorporated in the sort of logic that we undertake that is challenging the, the boundaries of the, the, the borders of the United States and recognizing once again, as many people did um, generations before, that the struggle, the anti-imperialist struggle that many people of color and especially black people in the hemisphere face is mapped on to the types of classisms, racisms, and other types of isms that come together to structure black peoples, especially those in the diaspora in the Americas, oppression. Um, so I would actually just like to stop there because I think I have, I've used up my one minute. <laughs> Thank you, and get started um, with, with more of a conversation. Um, the probability of being black, unarmed, and shot by police is about 3.5 times the probability of being white, unarmed, and shot by police. 84% of police officers interviewed from over 100 departments across the country said they have seen colleagues use excessive force. Nationwide, even though blacks and whites have similar levels of drug use, blacks are 10 times as likely to be incarcerated for drug crimes. In Maryland, African Americans represent 90% of those imprisoned for drug offenses. African American youth are nine times more likely than white youth to be sentenced as adults for the same crime. Prison sentences for black men are about 20% longer than for white men and for the same crime. Uh, black women are being incarcerated at higher rates um, as the years go by. There are more uh, blacks under correctional control today in prison or jail, on probation or parole. So this is the whole network when we talk about mass incarceration. It's not just being in jail, but it's also being on probation or on parole and connected to this kind of carceral um, world that we live in. Um, more are under correctional t control today than were enslaved in 1850, a decade before the Civil War began. Only two states, and actually this is updated, um, to three, allow people serving time because of Florida um, on parole or with criminal records to vote. All other states deny one or more of these groups the right to vote. And even though Amendment 4 passed, we have a crisis here in Florida when it comes to voting rights. Um, we know that, but in DeSantos, as we talked about, is trying to chip away at the progress that we made by voting to pass Amendment 4. So, this is a real crisis. Um, the NAACP in Florida is working on getting testimony out right now um, to, try to, to try to gain back the rights that we voted for. That's right, that's right. Um, so these are just some statistics to show about the disenfranchisement, the historic disenfranchisement that continues today. Um, the, um, what I really appreciated about what Vince said is, is really to honor the experiences, and we got to do this yesterday in Gator Tales, the experiences of black and brown students who went to UF. And I, the whole time I watched that film, I thought, what will their current students say if they got to do the play and share their experiences of being here at UF? 
And in some ways they may be different and in some ways they'll be very similar. And so we still have a crisis on campus when it comes to recognizing our black and brown students and, and um, making them feel as welcome as they deserve to be. And I see some of my students here who I've asked this semester, um, and s some of the most brilliant students on campus. Um, you know, would you send, would you recommend that black students go to the University of Florida? And they couldn't, not all of them could say that they would. And um, one student is here who came to my office later and um, she said, you know, actually I was one of the people that said yes because it, it made me who I am today and it was through that experience that I am who I am. Um, but what does that experience need to be and how, do, what do you need to go through to become who you are? And so there, these are questions that um, we wrestle with as faculty who are teaching here. Um, so that's one thing I want to do is honor the experiences of students who came before and who are here now because their experiences are really important. Um, one of the classes I teach here is on Black Lives Matter um, and it's a course that um, first seeks to create a history of the Black Lives Matter movement or moment, um, but second it seeks to make the university accountable to an important political project that's being run by young activists and LGBTQ members and um, and students ar around the country. And so um, it was a space to, to, to talk about the failures of democracy and capitalism and the criminal justice system. And the work that these students did, and um, some of you are in the room, is just really tremendous to uncover um, you know, um, stories about juvenile justice, implicit bias, the war on drugs, the death penalty, the school to prison pipeline. Um, voting rights, plea bargains, this, the treatment programs. So um, these are just some of the things that the students here are working on and presenting policy proposals to, to, to change the world in which we live. And so I love that this um, morning has been about where we've been um, and where we're going. And because it's the students here and across the country who are telling us where to go and leading us and um, together with all of us, I think we can get to um, find kind of these the meaning of liberation in today's world. So um, the questions that I've been wrestling with for the panelists are open to the community if you have things you want to say about this. Um, you know what? I'm not even going to ask my questions. There are people who want to say things. So let's just get to it, um, please. Good morning. Uh, There's uh, mics there. I don't know if this works. No, you better. Okay. Speak into the mic. Nadia. Nadia. Nadia, how are you doing? Okay, uh, I feel honored that you're here because I feel that I had a lot to do with the Dream Defenders being organized because you came to my Freedom House in Quincy, Florida. And then after that meeting, you went on your way. It was an interracial group. It was not just a black organization. Uh, it, there was one gentleman, young man, who was a Latino. Uh, he's not here today, is he? My question to you, uh, as the Dream Defenders went on your way, what is your philosophy today for the next generation? Because the philosophy has to go beyond black, has to go beyond white. It has to become cosmopolitan. So what is the philosophy of the dream defenders for my grandchildren? Oh, okay. Um, so to bring back um, a meal called Cabral, right? That's uh, organizer in, in, in Cape Verde. Um, oh my God, I lost my train of thought. Um, 
is that we need to create a new we. Like we are a populist socialist organization. That is our philosophy. We're abolitionists. We believe that there needs to be alternatives to prisons. We can't keep locking people up and being punitive or else we're never going to heal. We're never going to change. We need to look at the way capitalism has damaged all of us, right? So we currently, we are, we are a multiracial organization. We are black led. Um, our staff has five, six people, six people now. Um, and six of us are black women. Um, but our membership looks like everybody. And, and with that in mind, and with the listening projects that we've done, um, it is in our best interest to divest in basically everything that we have going on now, um, and reinvesting. Because we cannot continue to, um, sure. <laughs> we know that this isn't working. We know that we are in a terrible late stage capitalism where you know tim's timbaland is uh, is making ads about uh you're never going to retire and neither will these boots right like what is the um like what are we setting up we we, we know that it just this does not serve us and that we have so much more that we deserve there's so much money to go around um you know, GEO Group is a private prison company out of um, Florida. They're based in Boca Raton. They sent us a cease and desist letter last year because we were bullying them, um, and that was really cool. But they make billions of dollars every year, literally profiting from locking people up, from separating families. They are invested in these uh, hard on immigration crimes and in our communities, these drug laws. So our vision is ending all the things that do not serve us and building a world where everybody has what they need, where everybody has access to education and food and shelter and healthcare and can thrive. Um, one of the other things we're looking at, and this is a national project, is what's it look like to repeal the 94 crime bill? Um, this is a, a hallmark piece of legislation that you know was passed with the Clintons, that put so many more of us in jail. Right, ten, twenty, life. Right. There's truth in sentencing, where if you get a, a if, if you get sentenced to something, you have to serve 85% of it mandatorily. We have somebody. One of our members. Her name is Jessica. Her partner has been in jail in Rockford, Illinois, since he was 14, and has to serve it all right? He's been in jail for 12 years, grew up inside, was charged as an adult, grew up inside a prison. Like, that is not the world that our grandchildren need. That is not the world. Um, it's the world that we need to take down. Um, I, thank you. Yeah. I, I just wanted to say quickly that um, well, first, from looking from Texas, we've been so inspired by, by your work and the Dream Defenders and thinking about how do you build these multicultural, multiracial organizations that are tackling the whole system, right? And so in our story, and, and the quick one is, you know, in the last couple of years, uh, Im immigration struggles has been at the center. So let's add that intersection, right, of migration and citizenship status and thinking about how that fits in. And in our state, we, we, you know, we've been under assault from the state legislature and from the Border Patrol for a very long time. Um, geo groups operating huge private detention centers right next door to their private prisons and so we're trying to fight both of those in one place uh, and then we're fighting um, sort of various Black Lives Matter um, um, campaigns right we of course had Miss uh, Sandra Bland happen in Texas in my own local community Mrs. Jacqueline Craig was attacked by the police and that led to a, a whole um, wave of sort of black brown coalition building at the local level where we're talking about immigration and it's not just a Mexican thing, right? We're talking about Haitians too and we're, we're having those conversations together uh, or where we're, we're, we're talking about, it, it, it's been neat. It's, it's kind of, it's, it hasn't happened just theoretically and not just by concerted listening sessions or reading history, but also just on the ground and in the trenches of struggle. These relationships are getting built across racial lines that allow for us to see these issues as interconnected in new ways. Um, and so, you know, when we, a couple of years ago, our state legislator passed a show me your papers bill called SB4, uh, and we uh, were in a campaign locally to get our city of 900,000 people to join a lawsuit against this bill. And, um, and it was really cool, right, because uh, uh, we were talking about how it would create um, 
you know, all this new arbitrary authority for police to do racial profiling and, and knock people's heads. And, um, and a bunch of African-American activists who were there uh, uh, in support of Mrs. Craig and fighting police brutality on that front said, well, I don't know anything about immigration, but if it's going to make the cops more powerful, <laughs> right, we're on your side. <laughs> right? and, and so we started finding ways to work together in that local way, too. So um, I, I, I would say, as someone who studies coalition building, um, Yes, there's connections. Uh, are African Americans and Latinos separate or, or not? Yes and, and yes, right? <laughs> and, uh, and then how do we think about where are this, the concrete important differences that we have to talk about and, and work through together? Uh, one of you mentioned the importance of history. I'm all with that. Another one of you talked about how schools like this one are, are pushing Eurocentric curricula, how that uh, uh, reinforces town versus gown, and we, we see that constantly. But uh, in case y'all don't know, I push it all the time, but somebody mentioned legislation in 1994. We had state legislation in 94 called Required Instruction K through 12, whose 20 elements included a paragraph on black history, Hispanic history was in that law as well. And so far out of 67 Florida counties, three are clearly in compliance. Another seven bounce on and off the list, which means they're just checking off boxes once in a while, uh, including Alachua County. Here, our kids might hear about uh, uh, Fort Mose, but they don't hear about eight, eight other black towns existing for centuries and fighting off domination. Where's Dr. Rivers? Is he still? Yeah, so you got to check out what that man taught us. And uh, they might teach Black Wall Street, but they don't teach Rosewood and Wall Street as a continuum of a wave of terror going all the way back to Hayes Tilden. And we, what, what do we do about the resistance to teaching our history? How do you know, uh, how, how do we have the basis of unity without that history? And the only chance, probably the better, best chance we got of getting that law implemented is sitting right here because we have a representative who said that he will fight for implementation of that law. But the culture, the dominant culture here, hates the idea of the agency of black people. Thank you uh, for mentioning that. Um, and in fact, uh, not too long ago, I just was at uh, Eastside High School at their, uh, they teach African American history they have an African-American history course um, there, and I did some uh, work over there. Um, but the, the simple answer to your question as far as how do we push for that 1994 um, bill as far as the requirement of African-American history in the classroom, and unfortunately, it's an answer that a lot of people, um, they hear it and they clap for it, but they don't want to really make no moves towards it. And it's really a lot of things concerning um, issues of African Americans, especially in the state. And really, you ha first, the first step, honestly, um, obviously organizing um, around the issue. But secondly, you have to put together a strong political action committee. And this is the thing where we fall short of as far as our understanding of how these systems work, right? So we think if we just uh, protest, 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 then we can somehow capitulate the system to fall to our knees and capitulate to our demands. No, that's not necessarily how it all works. And part of, and, and part of it, and in, in, in coming from a political science uh, perspective and understanding, and just because you have a political action committee doesn't mean that the, the, your uh, agenda is going to go forward either. But at the same time, um, in having a uh, organizing political action committee, uh, in addition to the other uh, things, the pr in addition to the protests, in addition to the organizing at the grassroots level, in addition to all those things, um, you know, is a is a very important part. And it, honestly, to be on and to be totally honest with you, um, especially talking about uh, advocating for the African American uh, uh, some type of Afrocentric curriculum at the K through 12 level, you have to get the parents involved. And so many of our parents are so despondent to their own children. Unfortunately, and that's that is a and that is a system, unfortunately, of our our society, and unfortunately, that hurts us even more so. 
And so, and so all of these things are kind of tied together. But I would say the, the, the part of it is those, you have to organize with that political action committee, being able to say, okay, look here, politician, if you don't do what we want you to do, then we are not, we're going to pull our funding from you, right? And so that's what, and so, so that political action committee entails a piece of that capital, right? And so, and so until we understand that to a, a deeper level, um, unfortunately, it's going to be the situation where, like you said, only three of the counties um, uh, were adhering to it out of 67. And um, a lot of our children, and when I say our children, not just black children, but children in general in the state um, are, are um, getting shafted as far as the true history of this state. Check, check. Um, so my question is, what is that Afrocentric curriculum gonna, gonna look like? What is it gonna in include? Um, and also, in thinking about your question about multiculturalism, I'm wondering if, if that multiculturalism is gonna include some element of a transnationalism. Um, if we look at Brazil, for example, um, the structure of the 1994 bill, um, a lot of these bills that have been passed in the United States have been um, imported wholeheartedly and used in Brazil, um, but don't get it twisted, it's not just Brazilian, Brazilian elite looking at the United States as a model, but it's the United States looking at Brazil as a model as well. Um, so I don't know if you noticed that um, Steve Bannon has been influential in Bolsonaro, Bolsonaro's um, politics in his election. So there's a synergy that's happening among the elites um, within the Americas, the white elites, or those who are classified as white in their various countries um, that I think we need to pay attention to. And it brings up the question for me, is it quite possible that we could see a situation where if we think about Brazil, and I'm not even talking about Colombia, which is, a, is just a horrible situation right now for black people. Um, but in the last few years in Brazil, the incarceration rate of black male youth um, has gone up over 750%. Um, between the last two censuses, three million black men just disappeared. They're just unaccounted for. And on the record, about 60,000 black or people were killed um, in Brazil last year, um, and the, the majority of them by the police. And so of that 60, Thousand, um, and this is on the record, about 85% or so are um, black youth. So that number has actually gone up since the beginning of this year. So we're looking at probably, you know, you could get a situation where by the end of this year, easily um, 80,000 um, black people have been murdered in Brazil. So I kind of wonder sometime if um, we could end up having, you know, moving forward, for example, on some of the, the bills concerning incarceration um, in the United States, but see an increase in other parts of the Americas and companies going to those country, countries and using that black American prison labor. Um, so I kind of wonder, what does a, 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 again, a transnational project look like? And I'm asking that from our perspective because People in Latin America are trying to have conversations with us all the time, but, we, but as a collective, I think, in this country, they are largely ignored. Check. All right, so quickly on the education front, uh, uh, one thing we're doing, and we, of course, Fort Worth at the state level, or Texas at the state level, right, the educational standards are horrible. You all know that story, right? You don't know about our textbooks. Right, and all the terrible things that they published that then get exported elsewhere, right? Like about how enslaved Africans were voluntary immigrant workers, right? Um, th th terrible things like that, right? So what we figured out in, in Texas, thanks to some visionary board leaders at, in our local school board, which our district's got 86,000 students, 63% Latino, about 25% African American, very small white Anglo population. Um, they figured out they didn't need to change the state standards and they developed a curriculum overlay process where last year we, we created African American and African studies and wove it into the curriculum K through 12 in the core social studies curriculum and this year we're doing Latinx and Latino Latin American studies and trying to do the same thing where so any teacher that goes and pulls up the standards mixed in with our TEKS, our terrible statewide standards uh, are African American, African studies, Latin American and Latinx studies all together, and I'll be teaching that in, uh, in the social studies classes from K through 12.
Check, check. Okay, hello. My name is Michaela. I'm a third year criminal justice student at Florida Agriculture and Mechanical University. My question is, how do we specifically address the traumatic experiences we face from seeing so many people that look like us struggle and being killed in the streets because the same people that turn out to be a victim or a perpetrator of these violent crimes are the same ones that feel like they have no power. They feel like they can't make social change. That's my question. Okay, um, organized people is always gonna be, or you know, we try, organized people versus organized money, right? Building collectives, defining the new we's, pulling people together for common goals, like the organizing work is just like, it has to be the way forward. We are, People are, you know, it's a conversation that comes up a lot, but people are tribal. How are we building a new tribe that encompasses all of us so that the one DeSantis and the one DeSantis administration is no match for everybody that votes and that everybody that shows up to their local elected like offices? You know what I mean? It's just like we have to be invested in the project of building power. Um, and that looks like a lot of things, but like first and foremost, it's, it's knocking on doors, talking to your other students, bringing them to the local whatever meeting, sitting at the city council meeting and making sure that you know, things are going according to what's in the best interest of our people, taking over city council meetings if you have to. They work for y'all, like they work for your students who are your, your board of trustees at school. Like, you always have to ha have an eye on power so that you can hold them accountable and like fight for us to have power and governance and whatever. I'm done. <laughs> yeah. um, thank you uh, for that question. And I know exactly. Hello? Hello? Okay, there. Um, I know exactly. Um, Hello, hello. This one's working. Yeah, there we go. So, yeah. <laughs> All right. Like I said, thank you for your question. And I know exactly how you feel because it's like, as Naila said, you do have to organize. You have to. Uh, the main thing also is educate. But the flip side of it, um, we do um, have to recognize what the struggle is. I understand um, completely what you're saying here. I mean, because on the one hand, you have people who want to be out there, who want, but at the same time, they're faced with the prospect about to get evicted. Mm -hmm. Faced with the prospect of how I'm going to eat the next day. So it's, it's, it's very hard. And so, and, and, and as I said before, we have rampant inequality in this country, and especially as it concerns um, the, uh, the black experience. So not saying that every black person is poor, but just saying for the people who want to get out there and want to be a part of the conversation, who look like us, but who are in that um, uh, that demographic, it's very hard to do to do that. And so, um, again, what I would suggest, as as Nalia, uh, Naila suggested, uh, with the uh, the education, with the organizing, but also um, I will also say too, uh, for you personally. Um, is to definitely hold your, 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 your peers accountable, right? So um, uh, you as a college student, you guys have a lot of power. You guys probably have the most power in any uh, situation. And it's something that I explain to my students here. For example, University of Florida is a top 10 institution, right? But yet Gainesville is in the top 10 as far as inequality in the country. Talk about it. <laughs> so, you, as students, can rectify that. So one of my students, uh, some of my students, and they, they're here in the room today, um, I'm the, the UF advisor uh, for the NAACP uh, Gator chapter, and what they did for the entire Black History Month, and many of you leaders do not know about this, but they held the free breakfast program every Saturday, feeding these kids with their own money, with their own money. 
So that's just so something simple as that can change the world. And so while you and so while you embarking on something on that, and then that's the time for the education. So my students uh, also built the African Center. A curriculum in which they're uh, teaching this, the students as far as not only black history because unfortunately in our country we've come to terms uh, come to think of blackness just in terms of historical terms. No, we're, we're, we're black scientists, we're black engineers, we're black sociology, we're black everything, right? So these are the things that my students um, were able to do while they feeding our babies over on the east side um, and, and unfortunately we didn't have the money to continue on the project going forward, but um, uh, if you politicians in here kind of reading between the lines, <laughs> right? So we was right in the Porter's area doing this work. Um, so that's what I would suggest, one of those ways of doing that. It, it, it don't take much, two, three, two, three, you guys. That net check drop, hey, let's take a portion of that and let's go in, the, in this, you said uh, you and uh, I also went to school, I went to Florida State, but I was always at FAMU, always. And one of the things we did was uh, we, we were in Frenchtown, and we know a lot of development, uh, uh, gentrification is going on in Frenchtown and, and Tallahassee, so I know about it. And so, and so, and so that's one of the things that, that you can do, uh, you know, not saying you have to do a free breakfast program, but just something along those lines, it don't take much. I'm gonna say one thing real quick. Within, without, and against, right? This is something that we actually learned from Chilean students I don't remember what year it was, but it was um, adentro contra y sin or something. I, within the state, without the state, and against the state, right? You have to, this dual power that we're talking about, electoral, electing people that look like us, that have our best interests in mind, without is the, the breakfast program. What are the alternatives that we're building without the state to provide for our people? What are we, are we setting up free clinics? Are we setting up breakfast programs? Are we doing libraries? Like, what are the things that we are doing without the state, independent of the state, for our people? Like, what holes and gaps are we filling um, for our folks? And then against, which is, you know, we've got to tear this shit down. So. That's a wrap. That's a wrap. <laughs> um, I think that's officially time. I know that we're happy to stick around and have a, a, more of a conversation, but I know that lunch is waiting, and I don't want to be the person that keeps you from eating. So um, thank you so much to our panelists and to all of you who are out here today. We really appreciate it. We'll reconvene at 2.30, everyone, at 2.30. Courtesy shuttles available to Midtown restaurants. We'll see you at 2.30.